There's a lot of underrated watches out there, but most people would probably say that the Daytona isn't one of them. Hi everyone and welcome to Shaluso and yes today we are talking about the venerable Rolex Daytona. A watch that needs no introduction which kind of makes it weird to think of that there could be one that's underrated. But we're going to be talking about that today. Anyone who's been into watches for more than 10 minutes knows that the Daytona is one of the most sought after and in demand watches across the entire market. Whether it was the new one that was released last year that still hasn't reached very many customers, the discontinued ceramic version that was the poster child for modern hype culture when it comes to watches, and the Zenith Daytona which established the current generation of Daytonas after they shifted over from the manual wine vintage ones, which are stars on the auction scene in their own right as well. But one notable reference that's left out here is the 116520, the first six digit reference of the Daytona. One of the reasons why this is probably not as coveted as the other ones is because it did have quite a long production run. From the year 2000 up until 2016, Rolex produced this model, and in many ways it was a huge improvement on its predecessor, but somehow it never got the same love. And then when they tacked on a ceramic bezel, it was suddenly the watch that everyone needed and wanted, and prices skyrocketed close to touching 40 or $50,000 at one point. But in my view, that's not a reason to ignore this reference. On the contrary, in many ways it ushered in what is modern Rolex. Released in the year 2000, it ditched the modified El Primero that it had been using since the late 80s in favor of an in-house Rolex developed chronograph. This was a vertical clutch column wheel chrono with 70 hours of power reserve. And this set the benchmark not just for Rolex, but also for the industry. These days it seems pretty standard, especially expecting from Rolex, but there was a solid run where this was the only watch within Rolex's collection that had such a long power reserve. This also introduced the Rolex build quality that we know today to the Daytona line. Things like the solid bracelets, the easy link, that solid feel on the wrist, all of these were things that departed from the Zenith Daytonas. And when you compare it to its immediate successor, the 116500LN, well, that was distinctly a modern watch. As soon as they put on that ceramic bezel, it gave the Daytona a bigger wrist presence, especially when you think of the black dial versions, and also something very much of the times. And that's, in my view, one of the biggest advantages to the previous generation. By still keeping that steel bezel, it has echoes of the past and of even vintage references, while still being a modern size, and also something that will probably be timeless. And if you need proof of that, look at what they did when they replaced the 116500LN. They added that metal ring around it to give a little bit of a nod to the vintage references. So in many ways, even Rolex knew they had to correct things a little bit after the ceramic Daytona. And when you look at some of the price differences between the steel bezel versions and the ceramic ones, it then begs the question as to whether it's really worth it. The same thing goes when you look backwards towards the El Primero version. Yes, of course, it was a historical model that really changed the Daytona from being something that dealers had to struggle to push out to something that was commanding wait lists and even premiums in the 90s and 2000s. It also featured a modified movement from another supplier. And if you want to chronograph with an El Primero, you're better off just getting an El Primero then, especially one from the time. You'll save a lot of money and you'll have something that is entirely from top to bottom the watch it was designed to be. At the end of the day, it's important to remember that Rolex used the El Primero because they didn't produce their own chronograph and they needed to update to an automatic so that they could keep up with some of their competitors. But yet somehow the market still manages to forget these. And that's a shame because in my view, this is probably one of the best Daytonas. It's one that's versatile by virtue of the fact that it's got the classic look so you can dress it up a little bit more. And by not having that bezel that gives it more presence, it also means it's better for more wrists. So if I was in a position to be able to get a Daytona, I would get one of these because it ushered in, in my view, what is modern Rolex in its best format and specifically the modern Daytona. Something that is classic and timeless, reliable, and that has a great movement on the inside while still being nice and slim with 100 meters of water resistance. It's everything you could ask for in a Daytona without the crazy hype of the newer models that followed it. But let me know in the comments below, which is your favorite Daytona? If you were in a position to buy any Daytona, price no object, which one would you buy and why? I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments below. Of course, a big shout out to Chronix for lending in this Daytona. You can check their links in the description below if you wanna shop their entire range of new vintage and pre-owned Rolex. And if you like this video, make sure you like it and share it. If you wanna see more videos about watches, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell as well so you know when the next video comes out. 
If you want to see more Rolex content, check out my Rolex playlist. And if you want to see more pictures and infographics of watches, then make sure you check me out on Instagram at Chaluso. But thanks for joining me and shedding some light on one of the most underrated Rolex Daytonas on the market. And we'll catch you on the next video.